Hello, and welcome to the Albright Scholar for August 2020. My name is John Pankratz. I teach history at Albright, and every month it's my privilege to welcome BCTV viewers and residents of Greater Reading to take a glimpse inside our learning community up on North 13th Street, to look at the work being done by teachers and students, and to think about its impact on all of us. Well, as you can see, we're still on Zoom. We're being very careful, we're social distancing, uh, and we're still working and learning hard uh, in the face of uh, the pandemic. Uh, my uh, colleagues are getting ready for a very interesting semester of partially uh, in-person, partially online, often hybrid uh, styles of uh, classroom teaching. Students are bracing them for a very quick paced uh, semester that's been divided into two halves. And uh, we're now at the end of uh, a summer in which some students and teachers have partnered together uh, to create some wonderful uh, research. And that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, joining me are uh, uh, two of my colleagues and, and two wonderful students. Uh, Denise Meister from the uh, Education Department, Professor of Education, uh, and her student Natalie Buck, and uh, Beth Keister, who is no stranger to the Albright Scholar, uh, and her student uh, Jennifer Vasquez, uh, all of them uh, working on Summer Acre Projects, the Albright Creative Research Experience. Uh, welcome to you all. Thanks, John. Good. You can unmute now. We'll, we'll just uh, talk. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Jennifer and Natalie. Um, what was the attraction for you uh, uh, to spend your summer uh, engaged in research in your field as opposed to, I don't know, uh, simply having a different kind of summer? Mm. Well, for me, I actually met Dr. Keister. Um, I connected with her through Dr. Langren, who's my advisor. Mm -hmm. I'm a political science major, and we spoke about uh, pursuing an acre possibly um, this year. And so I, around, I think, November, maybe up earlier, she um, emailed me and it just kind of went from there. But the whole, like the reason why I decided to um, pursue an acre this summer and specifically work on um, a project about immigration is because I'm a oh, I'm a daughter of immigrants first generation so it's really um, you know I'm like obviously I have personal experience and being able to do the research and like Dr. Keister said get the individual stories out there I think is like really important so um, I mean, I, I find it fun and I find it interesting. So I think spending my summer doing that has been very rewarding. So you were really called to do it. Uh, yes, yes, for your sure. Your personal connection as well as your academic interest. Yes. It all came together. Natalie, mm -hmm. what about you? What, what, uh, you're looking at uh, uh, math testing, right, in the, in the school systems? Yeah, I'm looking at the Algebra 1 Keystone exam that students take in high school. Some students take it in middle school, um, and it's used as a graduation requirement, and they're hopefully doing that in the future as well. My interest for the ACRE in general, um, so I've been a tour guide at Albright since my freshman year, and I always talk about ACRES. I always talk about it when we walk past the ELCDC, and I always say how it's such a great opportunity for students. And I've always wanted to do one, and I never knew if I should do a math one or education. So I knew I was coming up to like the end of my time to do one, so I applied for one. I reached out to Dr. Meister, and I figured I could put education and math together by doing the Algebra One Keystone exam. Um, Dr. Meister also helped me come up with the idea for the Keystone exam, and we kind of just went off from there, and we looked at the public schools in Berks County. So it was kind of like close to home. I went to school in Berks County, and I took the Keystone exams and everything like that. Right, so you've uh, lived through it and you remember it, and, and perhaps some of our viewers on TV are experiencing post-traumatic stress as they're thinking about that Keystone Algebra exam. Yes. <laughs> Let me turn, turn to my faculty colleagues and uh, get their uh, point of view. Beth, of course, uh, immigration is one of the uh, <coughs> social processes that you study on a regular basis. Uh, so, so uh, I guess it was natural for you to 
uh, work with uh, Jennifer on her project. Yeah, it, it, it is one of the things that I'm already interested in. That's, that's sort of why, um, even though I'm in the sociology department uh, and Jennifer is a political science major, um, her, her advisor said, well, you need to go talk to this other professor who also is, is passionate about immigration, um, which is how the connection was made between the two of us, even though, um, you know, Jennifer's never been in a class of mine. Um, she's not in my department. Um, mm -hmm. But that's one of the great things about Acres is being able to work across disciplines um, and take, take what she knows about policy and politics and, and what I know about social processes and and uh, immigration is very much both. It's very much a political process and very much a, a social process. Yeah. It's one of the great things about Albright as well. I know Jennifer and Natalie really well, even though I, I haven't had them in class, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Denise, was this uh, 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 a fun opportunity for you to work with an individual student uh, thinking about pedagogy and assessment? Yeah, so I was excited when Natalie approached me. Um, I, I uh, am the chair of the theses um, for the people in the master's degree program, so it was fun to work with an undergrad. Um, and I knew Nat Natalie is a sweetheart, and she's very bright, so I knew it was going to work. And I liked the idea that she wanted to connect her mathematics with education. So she's taking uh, a passion for math, and this case Algebra 1, and she's not only looking at its impact on the county, but she's also going to find out how it's going to impact her as a teacher. We had planned to um, do interviews, but the school administrations are so inundated with the pandemic um, that we were just fortunate enough to get many schools answer our questionnaire. So we have, we have some data, probably not as much as we wanted, but it's a start. It'll be good for her master's program. <laughs> Right. Uh, Natalie, are you looking at uh, the experience of taking this test or the results or the relationship between teaching and the test itself? Or um, So in the literature review, we looked a little bit at how teachers have to change the curriculum that they teach to make sure it aligns with what the students are going to be tested on at the end of the course, because they do take the Algebra 1 Keystone as an end of course exam. Mm -hmm. um, I also looked at data over the last five years for all the public schools in Berks County I looked at students who scored proficiently, which means that they got advanced or proficient, which essentially means that they passed the exam and they don't have to take it again. And then there's also students who score basic or below basic, which means that they'll need to retest and they'll have to go into a remediation program. And then I also looked at data for students who are historically underperforming because that was one of the subcategories in the Excel sheets that they have online for public access. Hmm. Is it, is it a, a, the same or similar test every year, or does it get redesigned on a regular basis? Yeah, it's essentially pretty similar. The questions do change a little bit, um, but there's like um, assessments and anchors that the state has put in place in 2014, and those still hold true, and that's what teachers are still using to help with like lesson plans and planning for the exam. They give some sample problems and whatnot, so that's kind of been the same. Yeah. Uh, when you were a student here in Berks uh, County, do uh, you remember uh, being highly aware of the, that Keystone exam as something you were preparing for? Or were, I do. You, were you given algebra as just something that you should love because it's such a wonderful tool for thinking about the world? Yeah, well, I, I obviously have always liked mathematics, which is why I'm at Albright studying math. <laughs> so Algebra 1 is like one of my favorite topics in math. So I love taking Algebra 1. I took it as a freshman in high school, and I remember taking the Keystone exam. And at that point, I was graduating in the class of 2017, and it was supposed to be a graduation requirement. So me and my peers had to score proficiently on it, which I did, but like some of my friends did not. So I remember them having to like retake the exam and it was a big thing. Um, they ended up pushing the graduation requirement back to the class of 2022 now, just so schools had more time to prepare and help students with remediation. Because otherwise some of your friends wouldn't have graduated. <laughs> yeah, or they would have had to do a big project. <laughs> wow. Uh, do you have a sense of uh, how you grew up loving mathematics? Uh, because his, historically, of course, there's been a little bit of gender bias in 
in the ways in which uh, uh, young men and young women are, are acculturated to math. Yeah, definitely. I think my whole life, math has always come easier to me. Um, reading was always like my hard thing. I didn't understand what I read a lot of the time and I wasn't good at analyzing. So I was always put in like the bottom level English classes and I didn't like those. So I focused a lot more on my math classes, which didn't help out my reading, but it did help out my math. So it's always come easy to me. And I think sometimes the harder it is, like the more I like it because the more problem solving that goes into the problem. So it makes me a real nerd, but I don't know. <laughs> it's what I like. Right. Now, now, now Jennifer, in, in terms of doing sociological analysis, has uh, your high school math uh, training uh, helped you? Oof, I don't know. High school math? Oh, man. I, I went up to AP recalc I believe but I actually found it pretty funny that Natalie said that she like loves algebra because I really struggled in algebra and I, I worked extremely hard in that class to get like a good grade um but yeah high school math not not I don't have fond memories basically <laughs> okay T uh, uh, Jennifer do tell us a little bit about your research approach uh, I, I guess you should state the uh, phenomenon you're you're studying and uh, learning about then how, how you went about studying it um, So dr. Keister and I were like conducting interviews with um, immigrant service providers and like I was telling you before we're um, About to almost reach 20 interviews. So that's just been amazing. I've learned so much. It's um, been a range of people that we've interviewed um, attorneys uh, caseworkers, advocates, clergy, religious leaders, and we even ha uh, were able to have like this amazing opportunity to uh, interview politicians as well. And we've learned so much about precarious status, uh, detention, and deportations uh, effect on the immigrant community. And um, yeah, that's basically, that's basically what we've been doing. So. <laughs> okay, so you're just talking with professionals who are charged with uh, rendering services for the yes uh, immigrant community uh, people of different statuses and stuff. yeah yeah and we uh, we actually even though so the acre we it's a full grant type of, type of process to help students understand how to write an actual application um, and so we had put in our grant or our application back in January or February for our, our summer project and uh, that was that was our topic at the time um and then COVID hit and we decided to we we've actually been that became kind of a fourth component of our project so we've also been talking to people um quite extensively about the impact of COVID on immigrant communities um and there's no research on that yet so we're we're hoping to cut some cut blaze some trails there with that as well that that is absolutely fascinating because what we're learning uh, as this pandemic has uh, grown uh, that other what social indicators, social divisions uh, in American society have really been highlighted, mm -hmm. right? The unequal access to health care, uh, different forms of employment that put certain people in harm's way. So in some ways, you, you throw a virus at American society and all of a sudden you can see more clearly uh, some of the, uh, the social trends and some of the divisions, some of the injustices of American society as well. So you're taking that into account as you, as you talk with these people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, have people been eager to talk to you? Yes. Um, actually, just we did a finish an interview like less than an hour ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone that's that we've spoken with um, has been really helpful, really insightful. Um, and they always like ask us questions about like, what do we plan um, on doing with like our research? Like, do we plan on publishing something? And if we do to please like um, send them a copy. So I think that's great. Um, but like overall, what I've learned, it, I mean, like Dr. Keister said, there's so many numbers of um, obviously say, showing that there, that immigration is a huge issue, but being able to show, uh, get the individual stories is what we wanted to focus on, what we wanted to highlight. Um, and back to what Dr. Keister mentioned about like COVID, something that we've been learning and which I, which I already knew, but um, 
I'm grateful that other people are mentioning it so we can include it in our research is that a lot of these people, specifically undocumented immigrants, um, are, do pay taxes um, via like a TIN number. And these people um, did not receive any like support, you know, didn't receive a stimulus check or any type of help. So they're basically like putting money into the system and not getting anything back. So I, like you said, this virus has really shown like the injustices and and um, how some people suffer more than others or how some people are, have been affected more than others. And this is just one example of um, how the virus has affected the immigrant community, in particular the undocumented. That, that, that makes it so valuable to know this and to be able to show this. Uh, Denise, standardized testing has been a big part of education now for, uh, for some time. Uh, what's your sense? Has it, has it had a, a good influence in terms of lifting everybody's ability uh, levels up to a certain mark? Or uh, has it changed the experience of teaching or being a student? Yeah, so this big push started way back in 1983, A Nation at Risk, when basically the U.S. was seen as sort of at the bottom in science and math. And that's when all these accountability issues came into play and the common core across the nation. And as we know, um, schools are run by states, not federal government. So Pennsylvania is one state that said we're not using the national common core we will have our own set of standards, which came up with the keystones. Um, to get some federal money, though, you have to make sure that, you know, uh, the kids are hitting the mark. A lot of teachers feel that there's just too much pressure on the standardized testing and has taken away a lot of the other aspects um, of teaching, a lot of the creative things that, that they could do before. But now a lot of it is they call drill and kill instead of drill and skill. Um, so... I think it's not as crazy as it was, say, like five years ago, eight years ago. I think, I think states are starting to try to balance. Uh, Pennsylvania's put into effect not only the keystones um, and the PSSAs, teachers, that's part of their evaluation, but they've also put in other pieces um, like um, uh, average early progress. So that not what do the scores look like every year, but are they going up every year? Uh, schools set their own uh, limit, their own goal. And so there, there are better ways of being assessed than just a standardized test. The keystones, as Natalie said, they were moved now to 2022. They were supposed to actually go in effect and count this spring. And then, of course, COVID-19 happened. So there's a two-year reprieve. But... Um, I don't know. It's it's a work in progress. It, it keeps changing. Sometimes it's political. It's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Now, Natalie, have you uh, in your I guess questionnaire and uh, your contact with teachers have have you uh, assessed their attitude towards uh, this standardized benchmark or? Yeah, I've had some questions on like some questions include like, do you feel that this lines up with the Common Core standards, which are what they are teaching for for the Keystone exams? Um, if they think it's the best fit or if they think there'd be a better indicator for student success in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I also had some open-ended questions about how they felt their remediation program is doing. I was really interested in learning about the remediation programs that they have in place for students who don't score proficiently because they have to take it again. So some schools have things like study island, some just have remediation that they build into Algebra 2 classes and things like that. So that was interesting to see. Um, it's been a little hard to contact some of the schools, but I also think that's because of coronavirus and figuring out how they're going to get back into school this fall and figuring out virtual versus in-person stuff. So I do know that they have a lot on their plate, and I'm happy with how many responses we got. We're up to 11, so that's pretty okay. good. Uh, good, and it's a fairly detailed questionnaire that you've provided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your own sense about... Uh, this fall, I know that the Reading School District is going to begin online. I think others are going to have a significant online uh, component. Can you learn Algebra 1 online? So for me, I think it's very difficult doing math classes virtually just because math is a lot of hands-on, whether you're at the whiteboard or even just using pencil and paper at your chair. But all throughout high school and even in college, a lot of times my teachers and now my professors 
have us get out of our seats and go to the board and do the problems on the board with like a partner. It's a good learning experience. Um, then we're also trying to do the problem by ourselves, but we have somebody else helping us. So when we did things virtually, it's a little bit harder just because you don't have someone looking over your shoulder to tell you like, oh, you went wrong in this step, like go back to that step and redo it. So you kind of do the whole problem and then you find out you were wrong like 10 steps before. So it is a little bit harder. Learning algebra one, I think is also gonna be difficult because those students, some students aren't math people and math doesn't click for everybody. So they need that extra assistance and having someone there to help them and go through the steps with them is very important. And it's a little hard to do that over Zoom and whatnot. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think when you have people in the same classroom there and you see confusion on their face, you can reach out and you can stand by them and get them back on board. But if you're in a, in a Zoom room, uh, I think very often people begin to sort of fade away from that, that camera and just hide out uh, when the going gets tough. And that's, yeah. yeah. So well, you even as some way to substitute for that mm -hmm. cajoling and encouraging and personal helpfulness. Even as Natalie said before, um, a lot of the remediation programs like Study Island, they are computer based, but the, but the students are still in a classroom where a teacher is monitoring them working on Study Island. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's going to be a challenge, I think. I think so. I think so. Now, Beth, as you, as you looked at uh, people providing uh, services to uh, immigrants, uh, were their primary clients uh, uh, various Hispanic Latino communities or, or immigrants from other uh, locations coming into Berks County? Yeah, it's so funny because when we reach out and, and ask if somebody, if, if, if we can interview them, they say, well, what do you mean by immigrant? And I say, we mean everybody. We want to know about documented, undocumented. We want to know about uh, refugees and asylees. So our definition of immigrant was extremely broad. Um, and we got fairly, fairly broad. We, we definitely have a lot of people working with, uh, uh, undocumented populations and, uh, DACA recipients, the Deferred mm -hmm. Action for Childhood Arrival Program. Um, that we definitely have a lot of that, but we definitely also talk to people, um, who are dealing, who are working with refugees. Um, that we do have refugees coming back into the country now. There was a, there was a hiatus for a little while um, coming from all over Africa and the Middle East, right. Afghanistan in particular. Um, um, uh, again, asylum seekers, the nature of asylum is that you have to get to the country to seek asylum. So asylum seekers in the United States do tend to primarily be from Central America Mm -hmm. um, that come in via Mexico and the, and the southern border. And there have been a lot less asylum seekers as countries have all closed their borders. Yes. Not, not only has the United States closed its borders, but Mexico's closed its borders uh, as well. And so, so asylum has really uh, uh, been, been declining. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, so no, we we talk to people about all different types of, of immigrant um, status, right? From a variety of different countries. Yeah. And Jennifer, as you, as you did these interviews, were they primarily in English, or did you uh, do some in Spanish, or uh, a mixture of both? Uh, they were all in English. Yeah, mm -hmm. all in English. <laughs> we did. So interestingly enough, we like Jennifer said, we've done all just about twenty. Um, we've interviewed 19, or 19 of those will have been women. Um, wow. Even though we, we, we have asked, asked men as well, we've, we've definitely reached out to more than just women, but predominantly it's women working in these communities, which we found to be interesting. And we're, we're real close to about half of the people we've talked to have, are they themselves immigrants. Okay. Uh, first generation immigrants. Uh, or some second generation immigrants as well. Um, and so, so there, there seems to be a real desire to give back to the immigrant community um, if you yourself were, were an immigrant. And so those are just a couple of key demographics that we, 
uh, interestingly have have run across. That makes so much sense. If you've if you've managed to survive and achieve uh, through a process, then you want to help others yeah. as well. That's sort of what Natalie's doing as well, I think. Uh, uh, what what are going to be the products? I, I know that uh, at least on Zoom, all of the participants in these summer acres will be sharing their research and uh, their reports and their uh, productions uh, with the with the Albright community. Uh, do you see something written? Do you see uh, some sort of uh, documentary or report? Uh, first, Natalie, what are uh, what are you going to be sharing uh, as a result of your acre? Yeah, so one of my main things is I'm going to have like a paper we're going to write, um, break down our methodology, and we talked about like some of our literature literature review was for the purpose of the exam, then we had the five-year trend, and then we also had the questionnaire, so we kind of had three different parts, so we have three different things we can report on, um, so I'm excited to have that paper come together. I've created graphs of the five-year trends, and I've broken it up by all students, historically underperforming students. I also broke it up by the area the school's located in, so like if it's a suburb or urban, things like that. Uh, so that's uh, kind of interesting data as well. And also there are, um, there are some Pennsylvania State Journals, Education, and the Pennsylvania Council of Teachers of Math that may be interested in, um, in you know, peer review, of course, but down the road, <laughs> hopefully. I can easily imagine that. I mean, this mm -hmm. is highly relevant to their own practice, so mm -hmm. that would be great. J Jennifer, how do, how do you see writing up uh, your, your findings? Uh, well, I'm actually almost done like with the report. Um, we just met like a few days ago just to finalize some edits. Um, but basically, we just included also quotes about like what we found, uh, like uh, similar key themes throughout our interviews that um, these immigrant service providers have mentioned. Um, so that's basically what we're doing. Uh, yeah. And, and we, we also have intentions to, uh, again, after we've had more time to compile uh, all the data, the processing all the interviews in, in and of itself takes a long time, um, but to sit down with them and also write a, a, a journal article uh, that we can distribute. Um, I'm, I'm very much a public sociologist. I don't want it to just sit in a journal. Um, yeah. Who can we distribute it to? Uh, who has the power to actually make, make some changes? Um, definitely to put it back in the hands of the politicians that we've been able to talk to who are, who are advocates, um, to the legal teams that we've talked to. Uh, and so to be able to talk, talk publicly about what we found uh, and again, to, to really humanize these numbers, uh, we see it we see it with COVID in a very similar way to immigration. You know, there are 150,000 people have died of COVID. That starts to feel like this big ambiguous number, and it, and we lose the humanity in those deaths. Um, the same way when we say, you know, there's oh, you know, there's a million a million DACA recipients. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know what those faces look like. And so we're trying to put a story to all of those, those big numbers. Um, so to try to humanize the, the, the issue of immigration instead of just making it about big numbers. Yeah, we need to understand quantity, but also the qualitative experience means so much because yeah. that's the way we experience the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, is, this has been a, really a wonderful uh, conversation and in in some ways even though you're coming from different departments and with different areas of expertise um, there's a lot of shared uh, endeavor and a lot of shared uh, understanding that's come from your your two different acre projects um, it's been great it's it's been inspiring for me to see people in a really challenging and difficult times kind of a frightening time uh, be brave enough and have enough faith in the future uh, to continue this great work and this this kind of serious inquiry. So really congratulations to all four of you. Thank you, John, for having us. Thank you. Thanks for being my guest on uh, this edition of the uh, Albright Scholar. Uh, we will be here again in the month of September uh, with another program on the Albright Scholar. Goodbye.